Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Michael DDA speaking. Well, we are 80% done with Genesis. Oh, it makes me so sad. I love Genesis. I love our, our forefathers. I love learning about the set apart ways from them. We're starting 40 today. Last week we did chapter 38, Judah and Tamar. Interesting story. Then we went to 39 and we started Joseph's captivity in the house of Potiphar. We finished with him going off to jail, I believe. Let's see, the keepers of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because Yehovah was with him and whatever he did, Yehovah made him prosper. Isn't it interesting that everybody who had, how should I say, intimacy, I don't want to make it sexual, but uh, had a relationship with Joseph saw that there was something different in him. The Midianites saw something. The Ishmaelites who brought him down to Egypt and sold him to the Madanites. Remember, Yahovah, when they bullied Joseph, dealt with them. Potiphar saw that Joseph blessed his household that Joseph was blessed. Well, and then the prisoners, or the prison guards, knew that Joseph was a blessing to them. Well, we went from here, and we did Yasher last week concerning the house of Potiphar, and we saw that this woman, what was her name? Started with a Z, I believe. Her name was Zelka. Remember Zelka? Oh my goodness. The woman had the hots for Joseph. She was insanely infatuated with him. They called it love. I don't think it was love. I think it was infatuation. I think it was lust. She was in lust with him. He went to jail. She followed him to jail. Oh my gosh. What is that all about? What is her husband? Doesn't her husband know what's going on? I don't get it. Well, it says, Zelica was unable to persuade Joseph to hearken to her. So she left off going to entice him. Joseph is probably saying, thank you. Thank you, Yahweh. Well, we are now, this is what's going on. Joseph's in prison. And they want to let us know here. I think they even set a transition here. And Jacob, look at Joseph was still confined in the house of confinement. And Jacob, we're switching. There's a transition going on here. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, and all the brethren who were in the land of Canaan still mourned and wept in those days on account of Joseph, even his brothers who sold him. For Jacob refused to be comforted for his son Joseph. And Jacob cried aloud and wept and mourned all those days. How many days are we talking about? We're talking about years. Well, now we're starting 45. We're going back down, up, I guess, to Jacob's place. And we're going to see what his seed is doing. They're taking women for themselves. Oh, I think this is really an interesting chapter to see who it is that they're taking. Some in particularly are interesting. Well, let's get started. This is where we're going to begin today. How's that for a five minute introduction? And it was at that time in that year, which is in the year of Joseph's going down to Egypt. 
after his brothers had sold him. That Reuben, remember Joseph went down when he was 17. He was in the house of Potiphar for a year. And then he was sent off to jail. It sounds to me like some of this was going on even as he was in Potiphar's house. And it was at that time in that year, which is the year of Joseph's going down to Egypt, after his brothers had sold him that Reuben, the son of Jacob, went to Timnah and took unto himself a woman, Eli Uram, the daughter of Avi, the Canaanite. And he came to her, took a woman, from the daughters of Canaan. Wow, I'm really surprised that he would do that. Of course, look what it says. Uh, this is, the, this is the, the thing that Jacob is going to say about Reuben. Look what it says. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power, unstable as water. You shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Well, I think this is just one more example of the instability of Reuben taking a daughter of the Canaanites. And Eliuram. The woman, Reuben's woman, really is what it says. Eli, 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 Eli Uram, Reuben's woman, conceived and bore, bare him one, two, three, four sons. And Simeon, second born. Simeon. Let's remember Simeon. Remember when Dinah was taken? Do you remember what happened? He, she was taken by Shechem, and it was Simeon and Levi that went after Dinah. Look what it says. Now it came to pass on the third day, when they were in pain, that the two sons of Jacob, remember they as the men of Shechem, after being circumcised, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's Brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. Simeon loved his sister. He, she was a little sister. He was one of the firstborn, secondborn son. She was one of the lastborn children. Tough. And Simeon, Reuben's brother, took his sister, Dinah, for a woman. And she bare unto him one, two, three, four, five sons. And he afterwards came to Buna, the Canaanitish woman, the same as Buna, whom Simeon took captive from the city of Shechem. And Buna was before Dinah and attended upon her. What does that make Buna? She was a Shivka in. Simeon's house. She attended to Dinah. That makes her a concubine. So he had one woman that he took as his woman, and the other one he took as a concubine. Notice it doesn't even call her a wife, does it? And he afterwards came to Buna, a Canaanite, Canaanitish woman. The same as Buna, whom Simeon took captive from the city of Shechem. Buna was before Dinah and attended to her. And Simeon came to her, and she bore unto him Saul. It's his sons. She gave him a son. Dinah gave Simeon five sons. Here's Judah. He took, two took a Canaanitish woman. And Judah went at that time to Adulam. We talked about that last week. And he came to a man of Adulam, Hira, and his name was Hira. And Judah saw there the daughter of a man of Canaan. 
and her name was Aliyat, the daughter of Shua. And he took her, saw her. Does it say came to her? No, it just says saw her and took her. Oh, well, and came to her. There it is in the next next phrase. And Aliyat bare unto Judah Ur, Onan, Shiloh, three sons. We're going to see, of course, Ur and Onan are dead. We saw them. They got killed last week. Shiloh never has children. When they go to Egypt, it's just Shiloh. And Levi and Ishakar went to the land of the east. They took unto themselves women, the daughters of Jobab, the son of Yaktan, the son of Eber. And Yobab, 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 I guess would be his name, the son of Yaktan, had two daughters. The name of the elder was Adonah, and the name of the younger was Arida. Adonah, Arida, pretty names. And Levi took Adonah, and Ishakar took Arida, and they came to the land of Canaan, to their father's house. And Adonah bare unto Levi, look at this, Gershom, Kohath, Merari. This is really amazing. It says three sons. But we are missing something. And we're going to see this when we get to chapter 46. You're going to love it. I was amazed when I saw it. Here it is right here. Check it out. And their sister, Yochebed. Yochebed, the mother of Moses, was in the womb when they went down to Egypt. Look what it says. The name of Amram's woman was Yochebed. Amram was the son of Kohath. He married his aunt, the daughter of Levi. You know, most people have no clue that there was a daughter of Levi. Look what it says. The name of Amram's woman was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. She was in the womb when they came, the 70, to Egypt. We're going to see it. Like I say, we get the 46, we'll see it. There's only 69 people. But they counted this daughter in the womb, even though she wasn't born yet. Fascinating. And Amram, and to Amram, she bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister, Miriam. Well, that was Adonah. Here's her sister, who was taken by Ishakar. And Arida bare unto Ishakar four sons. Now we're switching to Dan. It says, Dan went to the land of Moab and took a wife, Aphlalet, the daughter of Kamudan, the Moabites. And he brought her to the land of Canaan. Aphlalet, Lalet, was barren. She had no offspring. And Elohim afterward remembered Aflalet, Dan's woman, and she conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Cushim, one son from Dan. Dan, as I recall, is one of the smaller tribes. You know, when you start out with one son versus 10 sons like Benjamin has, it makes a big difference in the, to the outcome later on. Well, now we're going to talk about Gad and Naphtali. It says that they went to Haran. Haran. Where's Haran? That's back up north. Remember Nahor? That's where Abraham left Haran when he came to Canaan. They're taking, look what it says, Haran, and took thence the daughters of Am Uram the son of Uz, the daughter of Nahor. Remember Deborah? Deborah was the nurse for Rebekah. 
And as I recall, she was the sister of Uz, Uz and Buzz, the sons of Nahor for wives. And these are the names of the daughters of Am Uram. The name of the elder was Merma, and the name of the younger was Uzith. And Nephtali took Merma. Gad took Uzith and brought them to the land of Canaan, to their father's house. Remember, we saw that this was a very long journey. And Merimah bore unto Naphtali four sons. Uzith bore unto Gad seven sons. I remember to keep this up here. And Asher went forth and took Adan. Adan. I think that's an interesting name for a woman. Hey, Adan. No, I'm the Adan. Well, I'm confused. And Asher went forth and took Adan, the daughter of, well, this is, remember, the, the daughter of. This is Aphalal's daughter. Aphalal's daughter. The son of Hadad, the son of Ishmael, for a woman. And she brought her, and he brought her to the land of Canaan. And Adan, Asher's woman, died in those days. She had no offspring. And it was after the death of Adan that Asher went to the other side of the river and took for a woman Hadorah. Avi Maal's, Avi Maal's daughter the son of Eber, the son of Shem. You know, I saw this this morning. The son of Eber, the son of Shem. What were the name of Shem's sons? Let's take a look at this, because I think it's important that we always get a better understanding. Here it is. Shem did not have a son. Let me fix that. He did not have a son named Eber. The sons of Shem were Alam, Asher, Arphaxad. Eber was in Arphaxad's line. Lud and Aram. Those are his sons. One, two, three, four, five sons. Eber in one of them. But, look at this. He's in the, in the line. Here we're talking about Shem. But Eber is his father, grandfather, great great grandfather. No, great grandfather. Father, grandfather, great grandfather. Maybe what they're doing is they're just kind of giving us an idea to let us know which line of Shem's line this woman is in. That's all I can figure. We're going to see, we're going to talk about a son of Abraham. He didn't have a son. I don't know who this man even is. We'll see it in a few minutes. I'm going to leave this open because we're going to talk about this person a little bit more. The son of Eber, the son of Shem. And the young woman, Hadura, Hadura, was a of a comely appearance. A woman of sense. Remember, this is... Who's, who's wife? This is Asher's second wife. His first wife died. And the woman was of comely appearance. And the woman, and a woman of sense. Sounds like she was a woman of worth. And she had been Machael's woman, the son of Alam. Well, here's, the, here's Alam. Nope, where's Alam? Uh, Elam, right here, Elam. Machael's wife, the son of Elam, the son of Shem. That one works. And Hadura, remember we're still talking about the same woman, bear a daughter unto Machael. And she called her name Sarah. Sarah 
we're going to see is a daughter that is going to be loved by Jacob. She's going to bring him comfort in his grieving. This is a really incredible little girl. Called her name Sarah. And Machael died after this. And Hadorah went and remained in her father's house. That's what a widow does as she goes back to her family. And after the death of the woman, Asher's woman, I had to play with this a little bit. After the death of Asher's woman, he went and took Hadorah for a woman and brought her to the land of Canaan. Look what it says. And Sarah, her daughter, he also brought with them. And she was three years old. Can you imagine leaving her behind? And the damsel was brought up in Jacob's house. Look what it says about the damsel. I want a daughter like this. And the damsel was of comely appearance. She went in the sanctified ways of Jacob's seed. She lacked nothing. And Jehovah gave her wisdom and understanding. And Hadorah, Asher's woman, conceived and bare unto him four sons. And Zebulon went to Midian. Now we're talking about Zebulon going to Midian and took a wife, took a woman, Mer Ish, Merisha, Merisha, the daughter of Malad, the son of Avda, the son of Midian. Midian was a son of Keturah, son of Abraham, and brought her to the land of Canaan. Now look what it says. And Merisha, same person. They just used a different vowel for some reason, M-E-R-U versus M-E-R-I. I don't know why that happened. Bear unto Zebulon three sons. And Jacob sent to Aram, the son of Zobah, the son of Terah. Zobah, Aram. We're talking about going back up north again, aren't we? Remember, Terah was, uh, well, let's find out who Terah was. I want you to see this. Zoba, Amram, Terah, Zoba, Amram. If we go and do a search, I've already got the parameter in here. I'm just going to go up. Here. And Zoba, the son of Terah, lived 30 years, and he begat Aram. There it is right there. That's the Aram we're talking about who had the daughters. And Aram, son of Zoba, son of Terah, had three wives, and he begat 12 sons and three daughters. This is the daughters that we're talking about. Let me just see if there's one more here. and Terah, the father of Nahor. Isn't that interesting? This is Terah, the father of Nahor. He's the father of Abraham and the father of Haran. He must have had these men or had these Zoba. He must have had Zoba when he was in Haran, he took another woman, apparently, and had more sons after, after Abraham, after Nahor. Oh, that's really interesting. Terah lived five years after he begat Zobah. Well, that's a whole other story, isn't it? But it's a fun tangent to see how it all fits together. I love finding all these names and seeing how they all fit together. Here's where we left off. And Jacob sent to Aram, the son of Zobah, the son of Terah, and he took for his son Benjamin. This is Jacob. All the other brothers, they took their own wives. But look at this. Jacob is going back to Haran to take a wife for Benjamin. How old is Benjamin? Wait till you see. And Benjamin 
he took a wife for his son Benjamin, Machaliah, the daughter of Aram. And she came to the land of Canaan, to the house of Jacob. And Benjamin was 10 years old when he took Machaliah, the daughter of Aram, for a woman. And Machaliah conceived and bare unto Jacob one, two, three, four, five sons. It says Benjamin went afterwards and took for a woman Arivath, the daughter of Shamran, the son of Abraham. Shamran, the son of Abraham. Where does that come in? Look, here's Abraham's sons, sons of Abraham. He had, he had Isaac with Sarai. He had Ishmael with Hagar. And with Keturah, who do you have? It's in Genesis 25. Here they are. She bore unto him Zimran, Yoktan, Yokshan, Madan, Midian, Ishbak, Shua. Then there were some other sons. Yoktan, here's Yoktan. Here he begat two sons. Dadan, uh, here it is. Well, that's even a third generation. Dadan bore these sons. And Midian, these sons. But none of those are Shamram. So they've got to be some relation of one of these sons. Where are they? I don't know. It seems that they're just telling us the line that these women fell into. That's all I can surmise from. Sorry, we have dogs to deal with. It's just going to be in my recording. I'm sorry. Uh, going back. Shamram, the son of Abraham, in addition to his first wife, and he was 18 years old. This is his second wife, Benjamin's second wife, when he was 18 years old. And Arevath bare unto Benjamin five more sons. This son, this, this is the only son. He's the youngest son. He's got 10 sons. Now we're going back to Judah. Remember Judah, we already talked about. Took somebody from Canaan. Bare three sons. Ur. I forget what the other one was. Ur, Sheila, and uh, see, now I want to go look. Sorry, I got to gotta look. Who did he bear? Onan. Onan. Ur, Onan, Sheila. So now here we are again with Judah. And, and in those days, Judah went to the house of Shem and took Tamar the daughter of Alam. Again, is Tamar the daughter of Alam? Remember, Alam is the eldest son of Shem. We just saw it a minute ago. There it is right there. Shem, there's Alam. The sons of Shem were Alam. Asher, our fact said. We're talking about the eldest son, but this woman can't be his son. It doesn't make sense to me that she can be that one and be that old. I don't know. I don't know how to resolve this. In those days, Judah went to the house of Shem and took Tamar, the daughter of Elam, a righteous woman, a righteous woman, a woman of worth, the son of Shem, for a woman for his firstborn Ur. Here's another father taking a son or a woman for his son. And Ur came to his woman, Tamar, and she became his woman. And when he came to her, he outwardly destroyed his seed. His work was evil in the sight of Yahobah, and Yahobah slew him. Doesn't say this in Torah. It just says he was evil, and Yahobah slew him. It does say that the next born, next second born son did destroy his seed. And it was after the death of Ur that Judah's firstborn, Ur, 
Judah's firstborn, that Judah said unto Onan, Go to thy brother's woman, and marry her as the next of kin, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan took Tamar for a woman, came to her, took her, came to her. And Onan also did like unto the work of his brother. And his work was evil in the sight of Jehovah, and he slew him also. Now this doesn't even say that he put his seed on the ground. But he did like unto his brother. Torah says that this man did put his seed on the ground. And when Onan died, Judah said unto Tamar, Remain in thy father's house. She's a widow. That's what you do. You go back to your father's house. But listen to what he says. Until my son Shiloh shall have grown up. And Judah did no more delight in Tamar. Remember I said last week that I thought that Judah was more concerned about Tamar maybe being bad luck for his sons and he didn't want to give her Shiloh because he was afraid. Look at what it says here. And Judah did no more delight in Tamar to give her unto Shiloh for he said, pre-adventure, he will also die like his brothers. And Tamar rose up and went and remained in her father's house. And Tamar was in her father's house for some time. At the revolution of the year, revolution of the year, is this one year later that Shiloh, he's now grown? I wonder. Maybe this is more an excuse than anything else. And at the revolution of the year, Aliyat, the daughter of Judah, died. This was his first wife. And Judah was comforted for his woman. And after the death of Aliyat, Judah went up with his friend Hera, 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 Hera to Timnah to shear their sheep. And Tamar heard that Judah had gone up to Timnah to shear the sheep. And Shiloh was grown up, and Judah did not delight in her. I put Judah had reneged on what he said he would do in giving her to Shelah. She, she, and Tamar rose up, put off her garments of her widowhood, and put a veil upon her. I wrote about this last week. Tamar and the seed of Judah. She was owed seed from Judah. She should have got it from Shiloh, but when she didn't get it from Shiloh, she said, I'm going to get it by hook or by crook. And she played the harlot. And Tamar rose up and put off the garments of her widowhood, put on a veil upon her, and she entirely covered herself. And she went and sat in the public thoroughfare, which is upon the road to Timnah. And Judah saw her, took her, came to her. And she conceived by him. And at that time, and at the time of being delivered, behold, there were twins in her womb. And he called the name of the first Perez and the name of the second Zerah. Well, remember, we saw last week that Perez is in the line of David. Significant woman gets mentioned in Torah. You know, all these other women, they're not mentioned in Torah that the, that the sons took. But the ones that are going to bear significant men in Torah are mentioned. We just see that over and over and over again. Well, now it says we got to go to Genesis 40. Let's go there. This is back in Egypt. Going back to the jail. This is a short chapter. And it came to pass after these things that the butler, the butler. Raya was telling me the other day she thought it was a cupbearer. Her thing said cupbearer. I think she's right. I looked up this word and it was all about liquids. Water, wine, 
it appears to me that he was a cupbearer. Has to do with drinks. Came to pass. I'm going to call him the butler just because that's what it says here. But keep in mind, we're talking about probably a cupbearer. The one who's going to, he might be the wine taster to make sure that the king's not going to be poisoned. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, well, yeah, just gave me the thumbs up. Yeah, I think that he is. I think he's the person who's going to taste it to make sure that everything's okay. How you feel? Okay, yeah, I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> and it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker, these are the, the head guys. He's the chief baker. This is the head butler for the king of Egypt offended their lord. They're a don. The king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. I have a note here. Let me just read this. It says, is Joseph being punished or is he being moved into a pivotal position by the providence of Yehovah? You know, sometimes we think we're being punished. But I think we fail to understand the providence of Yehovah in our life leading us and guiding us. My wife was taken to me. My original wife was taken from me. My children were taken from me. Oh, it hurts so much. But now I look back and I see the providence of Yehovah working in my life. I would not be here talking to you if it wasn't for that. Joseph would not have become the second in command in Egypt if it had not been for his brothers selling him into slavery. The Midianites taking him, the Ishmaelites taking him, the Madonites, Potiphar, and the guards at the jail. It's all part of the providence of Yehovah working in our life. I've said this before. This is a a note. This is actually Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. I've had one person give me a prophecy in my life. Um, this was the verse they gave me. 1 through 8 on Isaiah 43. It says, But now, thus says Yehovah, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Remember, Jacob is created. He's the flesh man. Israel is formed. He's formed at Passover. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Providence. We're going through the waters. We're going through the rivers. We're going through the fire. Oh, it's not fun. Jacob was betrayed in the house of Potiphar, even though he was doing a an outstanding job brought to prison when you walk through the fire you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you for I am Yehovah your Elohim the Holy One of Israel your Savior I gave Egypt for your ransom Ethiopia and Seba in your place since you are precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, gather you from the west, say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters. How do you get to be a daughter? By being a woman of the sun and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Oh, so beautiful. Verse 3. So he put them in custody in the house of the guardsman's captain. Look at this. They always say the captain of the guard. 
but it's really not. It says the guardsmen. These, these, are, this is a plural form with the ha ha in front of it. Ha guardsmen. There's the guard. Tabak. Tav tavak. Tavak. Plural. These are guardsmen. This is the house, the in the house of the guardsmen's head. They say captain. But this word can mean lots of things. It always gets translated as prince. Often we hear about Sar Shalom, and we're all told that it's all about Jesus. Sar Shalom, but we fail to understand that the Sar Shalom that we're talking about is going to be the 144 servants, or the, the servants of Yehovah, the 144,000-ish men of Yehovah. His Shalak, his Shalakim. And he put them under guard in the house of the guardsman's head in the prison where Joseph was also bound. You know what? I think that there was two prisons. I think there was, I put here, this may have been a minimum security facility for the more elite guests, guests of the prison. The chief baker and the chief butler were there. And it appears to me that Joseph was taking care of them. But he was also supervising, I would think, the rest of the prison. And so he had a bit of, a, of the ability to run around in that place, it appears to me. Remember, they said they did not even check to make sure that everything was going well because they trusted him completely. Wow. That's really saying something for a prisoner. Talk about a trustee. That's a trusted trustee, isn't it? And the captain of the guard, what do we call them? The, the guardsman's head charged Joseph with them, them, the butler and the baker, and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. You know, when you read this, how many years do you think has gone by before the butler and the baker show up? I was guessing it was almost immediately. But I think we're going to find today that it's nine years that he's been in prison before these guys are brought to him. Yehovah is got a plan. We're going to see today that Jacob tried to get out in the flesh instead of waiting for Yehovah to do it. We'll see that in our very next chapter in Yasher. And the captain, uh, the guard's head, guardsman's head, charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream. Both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with his own interpretation. And Joseph came to them in the morning and looked at them, and he saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with them in custody of his Adon's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? Pharaoh's officers. Pharaoh's officers. We're talking about the butler and the baker. Why do you look so sad today? And they said unto him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to Elohim? Tell them to me, please. Here's Yasher, and the captain, the guardsman's head, placed Joseph as an attendant on Pharaoh's officers. And Pharaoh's officers were in confinement for one year. 
And at the end of the year, they both dreamed in one night in the place of confinement where they were. And in the morning, Joseph came to them to attend upon them as usual. And he saw them, and behold, their countenance was dejected and sad. We're going to see that Joseph was nine years in prison before these two men showed up. He was with them for a year. And then one was set free, and the other one perished. Here it is. Verse 9. Then the chief butler told his dream to, to Joseph, and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded. It blo its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler, his cupbearer. But remember me when it is well with you. And please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. I put it in red. Why did I put it in red? You know, when I first read it, I thought, why did I put it in red? I had to go back from really forward to Yasher to find out. Here's what it says. It appears that Joseph got in trouble for asking for the butler's help, trying to work it out in the flesh instead of waiting for Yehovah to deliver him. Look what it says. And the butler to whom Joseph had interpreted his dream forgot Joseph. He did not mention him to the king as he had promised. For this thing was from Yehovah in order to punish Joseph, because he had trusted in man. Wow! Wow! Trying to work it out in the flesh instead of waiting for Yehovah to fulfill it for us. Oh my gosh, that touches my heart. The leading of Yehovah, he's going to make it clear. We do what we were created to do and let Yehovah bring it to pass. We are not the master of our destiny. Yehovah is the master of our destiny. He says, for indeed, I was stolen away. He's still belly aching to this butler. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of he the Hebrews. And also, I have done nothing here that they should put me into this dungeon. This dungeon, this hole, this prison, it's called a bar. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, yeah, he wants, I, give me some of that. I want some of that. I also was in my dream, and there were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. And the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. The birds ate them. So Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation of it. The baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from, your, from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat your flesh from you. Oh, joy. Now. It came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. You know what? Let's take a look at that. It says it was Pharaoh's birthday. Pharaoh's birthday. Was it Pharaoh's birthday? Let's find out if it was Pharaoh's birthday. 
as I recall, it wasn't Pharaoh's birthday. He made a feast for all his servants. Was the feast for his servants? Or was the feast inviting, being in, they, they were being invited to the feast? All his servants. Who are his servants? Are we talking about his Aved? Are we talking about his underlings, the princes, the captains, the other kings of, of Pharaoh's country, the king of Zor, the king of all the other places that are there? I think that's what we might be talking about. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker upon, among his servants. And he restored the chief. Let me do this. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Well, now we get to find out the rest of the story. Oh, I love finding out the rest of the story. Let's go to Yasher. Here we are. In those days, Joseph was still confined in the prison house in the land of Egypt. In those days. Here it is. Look at this. He's been in prison for nine years now. And he will be there for a total of 12 years. Look what it says. This is Yasher. We're going to get to it. And the butler to whom Joseph had interpreted the dream forgot Joseph. And he did not mention him to the king as he had promised. For this thing was from Yehovah in order to punish Joseph because he had trusted in the man. Could Joseph have potentially have gotten out right then? I think he could have. It says, for Joseph remained after this in the prison house for two years until he had completed 12 years. If he's punishing him, sounds to me like he could have been released. Makes me have more of the fear of Yehovah in being presumptuous in what, he th what I think I'm supposed to be doing. I want to be led by Yehovah. At that time, the attendants of Pharaoh were standing before him, the chief of the butlers and the chief of the bakers, which belonged to the king of Egypt. And the butler took wine and placed it in the, before the king to drink. And the baker placed bread before the king to eat. And the king drank of the wine and ate of the bread he and his servants and ministers that ate at the king's table. Servants and ministers. I think we're talking somebody higher up. These are men who are eating at the king's table. His servants don't eat at his king's table. As we understand servants. The butler, the butcher. No, they're not eating at his table. And whilst they were eating and drinking, the butler and the baker remained there. And Pharaoh's ministers found many flies in the wine. Hey, Pharaoh, what's floating in my wine? Which the butler had brought. And stones of nitre, nitre, baking soda, chunks of baking soda. He didn't grind them up. So we're finding chunks of baking soda in it. Do you know what baking soda tastes like plain? It's terrible. I can see why I get rid of them too. <laughs> Stones of nitre were found in the baker's bread. And the captain of the guard placed Joseph as an attendant on Pharaoh's officers. And Pharaoh's officers were in confinement for one year. They came in at the ninth year. They're going to be there for a whole year. That's 10 years. He's going to be kept two more years before he's released. Uh, what have I got here? Uh, captain of the guard, I'm guessing. Well, yeah, captain of, captain of the guard. The, the head of the guardsman is Potiphar. 
I'm guessing that's Potiphar, placed Joseph as an attendant on the Pharaoh's officers. And Pharaoh's officers were in the confinement one year. And at the end of a year, they both dreamed dreams in one night in the place of confinement where they were. And in the morning, Joseph came to them and attended upon them as usual. And he saw them, and behold, their countenances were dejected and sad. And Joseph asked them, Why are your countenances sad and dejected this day? And they said to him, We have dreamed a dream, and there's no one to interpret it. And Joseph said to them, Relate, I pray thee, your dream. Pray you. I can't be thee. There's two of them. Your dream unto me, and Elohim shall give you an answer of peace as you desire. Well, it seems like one got the answer of peace as he desired. The other one didn't. And the butler related his dream unto Joseph. And he said, I saw in my dream, and behold, a large vine was growing before me. And upon the vine I saw three branches, and the vine speedily blossomed and reached a great height, and its clusters were ripening and becoming grapes. And I took the grapes and pressed them in a cup and placed it in Pharaoh's hand, and he drank. And Joseph said unto him, The three branches which were in the vine are three days. Yet within three days the king will order thee to be brought out, and he will restore thee to thy office. And thou shalt give the king his wine to drink, as at the first, when he was his butler. But let me find favor, here it is, but let me find favor in thy sight, that thou shalt remember me to Pharaoh, when it will be well with thee. And do kindness unto me, and get me through brought and get me brought forth from this prison for I was stolen from the land of Canaan and was sold for a slave in this place and also that which was told thee concerning my master's woman is false for they placed me in this dungeon for naught and the butler answered Joseph saying if the king deals well with me at, as at first as thou last interpreted to me, I will do all that thou desirest and get thee brought out of this prison. And the baker, seeing that Joseph had accurately, accurately interpreted the butler's dream, also approached and related the whole of his dream to Joseph. And he said to him, In my dream I saw, the, saw and beheld three white baskets upon my head. And I looked, and behold, there were in the uppermost basket all manners of baked meats for Pharaoh. And behold, the birds were eating them from my head. Baked meats. Does the baker bake meats? No, he doesn't bake meats. He's, he's probably thinking, what is this all about? Am I these pot pies? I, what, what's going on here? And Joseph said unto him, The three baskets which thou didst, didst see are three days. Yet within three days Pharaoh will take off thy head and hang thee upon a tree, and the birds will eat thy flesh from off thee, as thou sawest in the dream. In those days the queen was about to be delivered. And behold, that day she bare a son. Whose birthday is it? Is it Pharaoh's birthday? Let's find out. And, uh, and upon that day she bare a son unto the king of Egypt. And they proclaimed. This is, remember, this is, this is the eighth, no, this is the tenth year of Joseph being in this prison. Pharaoh is having his firstborn son born right now. And this is what the party's going to be all about. Let's keep this in mind because this is going to be important next week. And upon that day she bare a son unto the king of Egypt. And they proclaimed that the king had gotten his firstborn son. Oh, what a joy that was for me too. And all the people of Egypt together with the officers and the servants of Pharaoh rejoiced greatly. And upon the third day of, his, of, the, 
of his birth, Pharaoh made a feast for his officers and servants, for the hosts of the land of Zor. These are the heads of the lands of Zor and the lands of Egypt. Officers and servants. No, this is a different kind of servant that we're talking about. And all the people of Egypt and the servants of Pharaoh came to eat and drink with the king at the feast of his son and to rejoice at the king's rejoicing. And all the officers of the kings and his servants were rejoicing at the time for eight days at the feast. And they made merry with all sorts of musical instruments, with timbrels, with dance in the king's house for eight days. And the butler, to whom Joseph had interpreted his dream, forgot Joseph. Oh, no. And he did not mention him to the king as he had promised. For this thing was from Yehovah in order to punish Joseph because he had trusted in man. And Joseph remained after this in prison, in the prison house for two years. Two years. How old is the boy going to be at the end of two years? Two years old. Until he had completed 12 years. Look what it says. Then it came to pass at the end of two years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Well, we're going to continue. I don't have to go back to Torah just yet. Now, this is really interesting. As you recall, we just now finished chapter 40 in Torah. But I want to show you something. Here is, we're going to go back. 39, Joseph and Potiphar. 38, Judah and Tamar. 37, Joseph sold by his brother into Egypt. 36 was the line of Esau. And 35, down at the bottom, it says, now the days of Isaac. This is six months after Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, destroyed Shechem. They haven't even had the six-day war yet. That's five days, five years later. This is six months after the city of Shechem was destroyed. And at the bottom of this chapter, it says, Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his son Esau and Jacob buried him. That's it. That's all we get. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. What a ripoff! You guys, I showed you this. Jacob was a hundred years old at this time. A hundred and a half, maybe. But if Jacob is a hundred and hundred, his father can only be a hundred and sixty. And his father's not going to die until he's a hundred and eighty. So thinking now that Isaac is dead skews the next five chapters because we think Isaac's dead but he's not dead what's up with that and if we don't see it because we don't follow the ages of Jacob to understand Isaac is 60 years older than him it's a travesty how did he even get in there I don't know how it even got in there it doesn't belong there it belongs now at 40, not at 35. Well, let's look at the rest of the story because now we get to see the death of Isaac, the real death. Oh my goodness, it's incredible. Let's go back. And Isaac, the son of Abraham, was still living. Still living? Yes, that's what I've been telling you. Torah says Isaac died at the end of chapter 35. Here it is right here. Now, 20 years later, well, Joseph is in Egypt. He really does die. He was there when Jacob was grieving for Joseph. He was there when Joseph was in the house of Potiphar. 
He was there the whole time that Joseph was in jail. And he was there alive when Joseph was made the prince of Egypt. He died just after that. Oh my goodness. And Isaac, the son of Abraham, was still living in those days in the land of Canaan. He was very aged, 180 years old. And Esau, his son, the brother of Jacob, was in the land of Edom. And he and his sons had possessions in it amongst Sayer's seed. And Esau heard that his father's time was drawing nigh to die. And he and his sons and household came unto the land of Canaan, unto his father's house. I think he wanted to get his inheritance. And Jacob and his sons went forth from the place where they dwelt in Hebron. And they all came to their father's father Isaac. Isaac is also in Hebron. They're just living in a different part of Hebron. And they found Esau and his sons in the tent. And Jacob and his sons sat before his father Isaac. And Jacob was still mourning for his son Joseph. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Bring me hither thy sons, and I will bless them. And Jacob brought his eleven sons before his father Isaac. And Isaac placed his hands upon Jacob's seed. And he took hold of them and embraced them and kissed them one by one. And Isaac blessed them on that day. And he said unto them, May the Elohim, the Elohim of your fathers bless you and increase your seed like the stars of heaven for number. And Isaac also blessed the sons of Esau. Here's the blessing for the sons of Esau, saying, May Elohim cause you to be a dread and a terror to all that will behold you and to all your enemies. That's it. That's the blessing. Uh, which one do you want? And Isaac called Jacob and his sons, and they all came and sat before Isaac. And Isaac said to Jacob, Yehovah Elohim of the whole earth said unto me, Unto thy seed will I give this land for an inheritance. Here's Isaac telling Jacob the promise of Elohim. Unto thy seed I will give this land for an inheritance. I put women don't own the land, men do. We're talking about seed, spiritual seed. Thy sons, if thy sons keep my statutes and my ways, and I will perform unto them the oath which I swore unto thy father Abraham. Now therefore, my son, teach thy sons and thy son's sons to fear Yehovah. You know, people will say, Michael, you're changing the words. No, I'm not changing the words. Look what it says in Torah. It says, now this is the commandment. This is Deuteronomy 6. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which Yehovah, your Elohim, has commanded to teach you that you may observe them the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear Yehovah your Elohim to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. We're talking about men. Now therefore, my son, teach thy sons and thy sons' sons to fear Yehovah, to go in the good way which will please Yehovah thy Elohim. For if you keep the ways of Yehovah and his statutes, 
Yehovah will also keep unto you his covenant with Abraham and will do well with you and your seed all the days. Do you want the blessing? Continue in the ways of Yehovah. And when Isaac had finished commanding Jacob and his sons, he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. And Jacob and Esau fell upon the face of their father Isaac, and they wept. And Isaac was 180 years old when he died in the land of Canaan, in Hebron. And his sons carried him to the cave of Machpelah, which Abraham had bought from Hess seed for a possession of a burial place. And all the kings of the land of Canaan, do you hear that? All the kings of the land of Canaan. They knew Isaac. For heaven's sakes, one of the main kings was the king of Hebron, the very city that Isaac dwelt in. Oh, he had the fear of the Hebrews, respect for the Hebrews. And he knew that Isaac and Jacob was fair. And all the kings of the land of Canaan went with Jacob and Esau to bury Isaac. And all the kings of Canaan showed Isaac great honor at his death. And Jacob's seed and Esau's seed went barefooted round about, walking and lamenting as they reached Kirjath Arba. Remember, Kirjath Arba is Mamre, where the cave at Machpelah is at. And Jacob and Esau buried their father in the cave of Machpelah, which is Kirjath Arba in Hebron. And they buried him with great honor as the funeral of kings. And Jacob and his son Esau and his sons and all the kings of Canaan made a great and heavy mourning, and they buried him and mourned for him many days. And at the death of Isaac, he left his cattle and his possessions and all belonging to him to his sons. And Esau said to Jacob, listen, this is Esau talking to Jacob. Behold, I pray thee, all that our father has left, we will divide in two parts. Two parts? Two parts? How does that work? Didn't Jacob get the, the uh, birthright? Esau sold it for a bowl of porridge. That means two parts of three parts should go to Jacob. But is that what's going to happen? Watch. And Esau said to Jacob, Behold, I pray thee, all that our father has left we will divide in two parts, and I will have a choice. And Jacob said, We will do so. Here. Do you hear what's going on? He wants Jacob to divide it up. He wants to take the first choice. Wow. Yeah, Jacob was supposed to get two thirds. He was supposed to get one third. And Jacob took all that Isaac had left in the land, the cattle, the property, and he placed them in two parts before Esau and his sons. And he said to Esau, Behold, all this is before thee. Choose thou unto thyself the half which thou wilt take. And Jacob said to Esau, Hear thou, I pray thee, what I will speak unto thee, saying, Yehovah Elohim of heaven and earth spoke unto our fathers Abraham and Isaac saying unto thy seed, I will give this land for an inheritance. Here's a spiritual man in the midst of enormous wealth. Remember, Abraham he had huge gates. Isaac got them all. These are Isaac's gates. They've been growing for how many years? A long time. There's a lot of possessions here. But Jacob is remembering the promise that his father had just reminded him of. 
that it was all about the seed getting the land. And so now he says, and Yahovah Elohim of heaven and earth spoke unto our father Abraham and Isaac saying, unto thy seed I will give this land for an inheritance. We're talking about inheritance right now. Oh my goodness. What Yehovah has to say is important to Jacob, but not Esau. Esau wants the stuff. He wants the stuff. He doesn't care about the spiritual blessing. He wants the stuff. I want the stuff. Well, watch what happens. Now, therefore, this is still Jacob speaking. All that our father has left is before thee. And behold, all the land is before thee. Choose thou from them what thou desirest. Remember, whose land is it right now? Is it his land? No, it belongs to the, to the sons of Canaan. Canaan's seed, doesn't it? But he wants the promise. I'm sure his wife is saying, but honey, but honey. No, he wants the promise. If thou desirest the land, take it for thee and thy sons forever. And I will take this riches. Remember, Jacob is no, no, uh, well, I don't even know what word to use. Uh, he's got lots of possessions. He's got no lack of possessions right now. Jacob has lots of possessions. If thou desires the whole land, take it for thee and thy sons forever, and I will take the riches. And if thou desires the riches, take it unto thee, and I will take this land from me, and I will take this land for me and for my sons to inherit it forever. But now, look what happens. Here is Nebaioth. Do you remember Nebaioth? Or Nebaioth? Perhaps you might say it that way. The son of Ishmael. I saw that name yesterday and I said, I know, I know who that is. Here it is. It says, also Esau saw the daughters of Canaan had not pleased his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabayoth. There he is, Nabayoth. The sister of Nabayoth to be his woman in addition to the women he had. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran. Isn't that interesting? This is the man we're talking about. This is his brother in law. And Nabayoth, the son of Ishmael, was in the land with his sons. And Esau went on that day and consulted with him, saying, Thus has Jehovah spoken unto me. No, thus has Jacob spoken unto me. This is, this is Esau talking to Nebiot. Thus has Jacob spoken unto me, and thus has he answered me. Now give thy advice, and we will hear. And Nebiot said, What is this that Jacob has spoken unto thee? Behold, Canaan's seed are dwelling securely in their land. Then Jacob saith, he will inherit it with his seed all the days. See, here's a man that does not have eyes that see. He doesn't know that what Jehovah says, Jehovah will do. Stuff is more important. And Jacob saith, he will inherit it with his seed all the days. Go now, therefore, and take thy father's riches. Leave Jacob, thy brother, in the land, as he has spoken. Duh! This is a no-brainer, Nebaioth says. And Esau rose up and returned to Jacob and did as Nebaioth, the son of Ishmael, had advised. And Esau took all the riches that Isaac had left. Look what he takes. The souls 
the souls. Oh, that is so interesting. Probably the the uh, nafash, nafash, nafashim, the souls, the beasts, the cattle, and the property, and all the riches. And he gave nothing to his brother Jacob. And Jacob took all the land of Canaan from the brook of Egypt all the way down to the river Euphrates, way up north. And he took for an everlasting, and he took it for an everlasting possession and for his sons and for his seed after him forever. Let's go back to the souls that he was talking about. Who are the souls? Isaac had lots of men in his camp. Women and men who were following him, they were the souls. They were the property of Isaac. Look what it says here in Revelation. These would be Isaac's servants, both male and female. They're talking about the souls. Here's what it says in Revelation. And the merchants of the earth, this is after Babylon has fallen. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of objects of ivory, every kind of object of most beautiful, of most precious wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, incense, fragrance, oil, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies, and the souls of men. In some translations, it says slaves and the souls of men. The souls of men. We're still being traded. We think we're free men, but we are the souls of men that we're talking about right now. That's the human. That's the thing that's been purchased by them. That's what the birth certificate is all about. Oh, it's a vicious, vicious cycle. And Jacob also took from his brother Esau the cave at Machpelah, which is Hebron which Abraham had bought from Ephron for the possession of a burial place for him and his seed forever. And Jacob wrote all these things in the book of purchase. And he signed it and he testified all this with four faithful witnesses. He's got witnesses signed. Esau had to sign it. Faithful witnesses. This is all legal documents. And these are the words which Jacob wrote in the book, saying, The land of Canaan and all the cities of the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and all the seven nations from the river of Egypt to the river of Euphrates. Canaanites. Remember, we saw just recently, we came to a conclusion. We saw something in Torah. The Hittites are from Het. They're the Hittites. Het. Tav. Hittites. But I want to show you some things. This is talking about the land of Canaan. Let me open this up. I'm going to move it down a little bit. Let's see what we can do here. Cancel that. I want to make enough room for this to be seen also. All right. Look at whoa, who these sons are. This is the sons of Canaan right here. And this is Yasher. Yasher does a really good job of this. Their name is Het. Here's, here's the, the sons of Canaan. Zidon, Het. That's where we get the Hittites from. Amari is where we get the Amorites from. Gergashi is where we get the Girgashites from. And I see I've got this in here. 
Kagashi. Let's do this. <clears throat> the next one is Hivi. That's where we get the Hivites. And the Hivites we're talking about right here. The Hivites. Right? Then we have the Archites. They come from Archi. The Sinites come from Sini. The Arodites come from R-O-D. Zimodites come from Zimodi. And the Kamathites come from Kamath, Kamathi. Now I got this really weird, don't I? I must have put something right in the middle of this, this particular thing. Fix that too. Okay. So look what it says here. The next one is Genesis. Genesis talking about Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite. Heth, the Jebusite. So we've got Heth represented twice in this particular thing. We've got him as the Hittites, and we've got him as the Jebusites. But it also says the Amorites and the Perizzites. Where's the Perizzites come from? They're not one of the sons of Canaan. I don't get it. What nation did the Perizzites come from? These are all things that are in my mind, that go through my mind and make me question certain things as I study. We've got to ask ourselves these questions. If we don't ask ourselves these questions, we'll never find the answers. So we've always got to keep these questions in our forefront. I learn more from my questions than I learn from anything else. Okay, going on. And the city of Hebron, Kirjath Arba, and the cave which is in it. Remember, this is still Jacob in his deed writing out what is his. The city of Hebron, Kirjath Arba, the cave which is in it. The whole did Jacob buy from his brother Esau for value. What value? Everything that he possessed that was going to be given to him from Isaac for a possession and for an inheritance for his seed after him forever. And Jacob took the book of the purchase and signature, the command and the statutes and the revealed book, and he placed them in an earthen vessel in order that they should remain for a long time. This is how you preserve documents. You put them in an earthen vessel and sealed it. And he delivered them into the hands of his son. Later on, as we go through, yeah, sure. We're going to see at the death of Jacob that the sons of Esau are going to try to claim the, the cave at Machpelah. And it's going to result in the death of Esau at the burial of Jacob. Oh my goodness. I got to tell you this so you remember for next time. Esau took all that his father had left him after his death from his brother Jacob. And he took all the property. Here it is. From man. This is the souls. From man and beasts. Camel and ass. Ox, lamb, silver, gold, stones, bedellium, and all the riches which had belonged to Isaac, the son of Abraham, Abraham's son, maybe even Abraham's seed. There was nothing left ex which Esau did not take for himself from all that Isaac had left after his death. I think that's why Esau came down was to get the stuff. Yeah, he cared about his dad, but I think he was more, more inclined to go after the stuff. And Esau took all this, and he and his sons went home to the land of Seir, the Horite, away from his brother Jacob and his seed. And Esau had possessions among Seir's seed. And Esau returned not to the land of Canaan from that day forward. And the whole land of Canaan became the inheritance of Israel's seed for an everlasting inheritance. And Esau, with all his seed, inherited the mountain of Seir. Well, that 
is the death of Isaac. What a travesty that we have seen in Torah. And his son Esau and Jacob buried him. Well, now you know the rest of the story. We're going to turn now to Genesis 41. I still have a half an hour. This is kind of a long chapter. I don't know if we're going to get through it. Well, we'll try. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years. Two full years. Remember, what are we talking about? Two full years after what? Two full years after the butler and the baker were returned to their positions. Well, the butler was returned to his position. Remember, there was nine years. Then the butler and the baker were in there for another year and released. Now we're up to 10 years. Jehovah was going to keep Joseph in prison for two years for punishment. Now he really is in prison for punishment, isn't he? Well, how? Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. This dream is going to become so redundant by the time we read all this, especially in Yeshua. I apologize ahead of time. But this is what it says. Suddenly, well, here, uh, here it says Yasher, in Yasher. And the butler to whom Joseph had interpreted his dream forgot Joseph. And he did not mention him to the king as he had promised. For this thing was from Yehovah in order to punish Joseph because he had trusted in man. And Joseph remained after this in prison, in the prison house, two years until he had completed 12 years. This is the two full years. Suddenly, there came upon the, came, this is the dream. Suddenly there came out of the river seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they were fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. Oh, I didn't like that dream. He sleeps again, dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Seven heads of grain. That's not the kind of thing that you see every day. Then behold, seven Thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plumped, and the full heads, plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. I'm sure he's going, oh, thank God. Now it came to pass. Thank, thank myself. <laughs> Remember, Pharaoh's God. He thinks he's Elohim. Thank my, oh, thank myself, it was a dream. All right, I'm being a little facetious, I admit. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt, all the wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief butler awoke, spoke. Then the chief butler spoke, oh man, things are going so fast in Torah compared to how we're going to see it in Yasher. Oh my goodness, we're going to see so much more. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my fault this day. I was supposed to tell you about this guy when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guardsmen, the guardsmen's head, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream in one night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the guardsman's captain. And we told him and he interpreted our dream for us. 
To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass just as he interpreted, interpreted for us. So it happened. He restored me to my office and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And they shaved and changed his clothes and came to Pharaoh. Oh, I thought it was so interesting. And Yasha, Pharaoh says, bring him up out of the jail. But be gentle. Don't scare him. Isn't that interesting? Don't scare him because we need him to interpret my dream. Don't frighten him. There's just so much more for us to see. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can't understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. Elohim will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. An answer of peace. He said the same thing to the butler and the baker, an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, remember the butler or the baker didn't get a, an answer of peace so much, did he? No, he was going to be killed. In Yasher, we're going to see that Pharaoh is going to lose his firstborn son. Oh my goodness, you don't see that in Torah, do you? His son is how old right now? It's been two years. He's two years old. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I have never seen in the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the seven and fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as in the beginning. So I awoke. Also I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven heads withered and thin and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. And then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. See how it says God, I put it in red, why? Because it doesn't say God, it says the Elohim, ha Elohim is what it says. Here it is. Ha Elohim. Here's the ha. Ha Elohim. When Joseph speaks to Pharaoh, however, he always uses the definite article. The before the word Elohim indicating a definite or specific authority, mighty one, judge, or lawmaker. He always talks about the Elohim. So I'm going to read it as the Elohim. The dreams of Pharaoh are one. The Elohim. Remember, Pharaoh thinks he's an Elohim. Pharaoh, you're not the Elohim. There is a the Elohim. The Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Pharaoh, you can't change anything. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven bats, the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. The Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. You know what? Think about this. If you were Pharaoh and the Elohim was about to speak to you, what an honor that would be to hear from the Elohim of creation. I think that Pharaoh was starting to get an inkling about what was going on, especially towards the end. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout the land of Egypt.
But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following. You're not even going to know there was ever plenty. It's going to be so bad, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by the Elohim. And the Elohim sh will shortly bring it to pass. Oh my goodness. Was this at the beginning of the year? We're talking about two full years. I remember we were talking about the land being Unindated by the flood. When was that? When was that happening? I forget. I forget when that was. Oh, that was when he went into jail the first time. Eh, we'd have to push pretty hard to make a case for that. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. And let them keep food in the cities. Then the food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt. A, 20, a, a fifth is a twentieth. Doesn't seem like enough. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this man in whom is the Spirit? of Elohim. He doesn't say the Elohim. He says the spirit of a Elohim, perhaps, is even what he's saying. From the very beginning, Joseph's physical descent into Egypt, slavery and prison, the presence of the Sovereign One has been recognized by all who encounter Joseph. All everybody who has seen Joseph and worked with Joseph have realized that this man is different from all the other men they've ever come into contact with. Even Pharaoh says, in a man in whom the spirit of Elohim, the Ruach, it's really saying the man in whom God's spirit imbibes. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as Elohim has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. And you shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Oh, wait till you see the, what do you call it? When a president, what, the inauguration, the inauguration of Joseph in Egypt. Oh my God, talk about pomp and circumstance. You'll have to wait and see it next week. It's amazing. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Bling. And he went and he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So they set him over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. He's talking to Joseph. Without your consent, no one will lift their hand in Egypt, hand or foot. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name 
Zaf Nat Pa Ania. Zaf Nat Pa Ania. And he gave him as a woman, as a Nat, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of An. So Joseph went over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old. Here it is. Remember? 17. Taken from his family. For a whole year, he was in, the, in Potiphar's house. Then he went to jail for 12 years. 18 plus 12 is 30. Here he is, 30 years old. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Got to see the Joseph timeline. It's on my blog. And he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food in the seven years which were in the land of Egypt. And he laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the field which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the seas until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came. Okay, this is, helps us understand when the years are. When were the boys born? We're going to use this later on. Yeshua is going to help us to know the ages of these boys. And Joseph, and to Joseph were born two sons. What does my note here say? Oh, I've got to take a look at it. Uh, two sons before the years of the famine, when Asnath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Here, Manasseh and Ephraim were were twins born to Joseph, born when Joseph was 34. So four years, two years before, no, we said seven years, three years before the famine, these boys are, are born. And Joseph's wife, Asnath, the daughter of Potiphera, bare him two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Joseph was 34 years old when he begat them. And the lads grew up, and they went in the way in which his ways and in his instructions they did not deviate from the ways which their father taught them either to the right or to the left joseph called the name of his firstborn manasseh for elohim has made me forget my toil and and all my father's house oh he forgot his father's house and the name of the second was called ephraim for Elohim had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. That's what Ephraim means, being fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty, which were in the land of Egypt, ended three years after the boys were born. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all the land, but all the land of Egypt there was, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread, yes, because of Joseph. So when the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. Well, this is going to be a very interesting story that we're going to see just next week. The famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all the countries came to Joseph. And they say severe in the land of Egypt. It seems funny that they would say it that way because it's all the lands. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt. See what I'm saying? It seems like it should be the lands of the earth, all the earth's lands. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Well, this is where we're going to pick up next week. Jacob needs grain. Got to send his sons down to Egypt. 
they're going to look for their brother while they're in Egypt. Oh, it's a fascinating story. I hope you'll be here next week. We have so much more to talk about. Well, it's one o'clock pretty much right now, so I'm going to stop. But we're going to pick this up next week. Please consider joining me. Remember, this is going to be on Facebook, not Facebook, YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel. Um, search for We Are Israel blog dash Michael DDA, and you'll find all my videos, all of Genesis, some of Deuteronomy. All right. Well, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me. Bye now. Thank you.